Hello and welcome to Wonder Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad. Each episode we pick an area of agriculture or food production and this week we're talking about vegetable gardening. <laughs> This week, I wanted to talk about vegetable gardening. I have, getting, I have gotten many more requests in this spring than I ever have before from friends and acquaintances and family wanting advice on how to start a vegetable garden. So I thought... Gee, I wonder could, why that is. Oh, uh, they have a lot of time on their hands. And vegetable gardening is super fun. So I thought we could spend a little bit of time talking about what makes a vegetable garden a vegetable garden, some of the history about it, and some of my top tips some of the success factors in how to vegetable garden. Dad, have you ever vegetable gardened? So, you know, my mom was a gardener, mm -hmm. an avid gardener. I did hear that once you lawn mowed her artichoke, so that's kind of like vegetable gardening. I mean, she put it in the middle of the yard, and <laughs> to teenage me, artichoke leaves look a lot like dandelion leaves. <laughs> All right? I don't know why anyone wants to plant an artichoke in their yard. Anyway, um... I do remember growing baby corn once, uh -huh. and that was kind of fun. But for the most part, every time my mom tried to get me to help her in the garden, it just seemed like a whole lot of work that I didn't want to do. Mm, yes, it is work. It does take effort. That's true. Why? Why do you want to put all that effort in? For fun and enjoyment. Is it fun, though? Is fun. it really? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay. It does seem kind of peaceful and, you know, your mom and I had a garden plot in a community garden once mm -hmm. and we didn't use it a lot. But when we did, we did get some delicious food from it. Right. Like that's a big benefit is the food is drastically better. I have like a short list of like the vegetables and fruits that are just like a whole different thing. If you get them garden fresh or farm fresh versus if you get them from the store and like peaches, strawberries, broccoli, tomatoes. Yeah. Stuff like that where it's just, it's like drastically better. That, I mean, it seems like some of it could be. And some of the stuff I have had is, that was one of the times where, you know, you would pick up the tomatoes and you would just eat the tomatoes like an apple. And we thought you were crazy, but you really liked tomatoes. They're so good. Have you ever had like a garden fresh strawberry? Yeah, uh, like some little tiny ones that were that, that were pretty will good. Blow your mind. It's insane. Yeah. It's like the best food in the world. Good stuff indeed. That's what got Shepherd Book onto Serenity. True. Very true. Except for I don't know how fresh, like garden fresh, that strawberry was, but still true. So look, everyone. She has <laughs> trouble with the Star Trek and Star Wars reference, but she remembers the Firefly references. <laughs> so go me. I mean, they had, well, like, nine episodes. It's not that hard to keep track. Fourteen. So what I want to know and, like, talk about first is when people started vegetable gardening. Isn't that, like, the dawn of agriculture? Yeah, so, like, that's, like, the hard thing. So, like, the when you talk about, like, histories of gardening and histories of agriculture, academically, they get conflated a lot as, like, this is the same thing. And, like, largely they are. It's all about people growing their own food. Um, the, the kind of difference from what I see and the distinction I'm going to draw for the purposes of this episode is agriculture is really more about growing food for a larger need for economic profit, whether that's from specific profit or from trade, whereas like a home garden is, you know, negligible economic impact. It's typically just for home consumption. So like that's kind of the distinction I am going to be drawing for this episode. So, so it's gar it's food for fun, kind of like entertainment, kind of like Benihana? I mean, not necessarily. Like, you can have a vegetable garden to feed your family, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but, yeah, you're not growing it to support yourself and to make money off of it, basically. Got it. All right. So, again, gar people have been gardening for a long time on account of needing food. Um, I can't go into all of the histories of gardening throughout all of the world. So I'm going to talk specifically about the U.S. And a lot of U.S. history is informed by British history and British culture. So we're also going to be talking about the U.K. So this is a very white Western kind of look at the history of gardening. But 
we don't have infinite time in this episode. Maybe we can do more histories of gardening from other places in the world in other episodes. I would look forward to that. So a vegetable garden, also called a vegetable patch or a kitchen garden or a potager. A what? Is a kitchen garden. A potager? A potager. A potager. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. I'm going to be honest, I had not read that word in this context until researching for this episode, so I could be pronouncing it wrong. I don't feel like I've ever read that word, and now I think it's a great word that should be used more. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely little word, if it's pronounced potager. I mean, it's probably good if you pronounce it a different way, too. I don't want a vegetable garden. I want a potager. Maybe it's potager. Oh, well, then I don't want one of those. Or a potager. Definitely not. <laughs> Um, yeah, so people have been gardening for a long time, but in the 1790s in the UK, or I guess at that point, just England, um, after a war broke out with France, there was widespread food scarcity. And so the allotment movement began. So here in the US, we call them community gardens. In England, they call them allotments. So the government created land specifically for people to use as a vegetable garden um, in kind of a community garden style. Uh, that was a branch from agricultural policy um, at the time in the 1790s. It wasn't really seen as distinct from agricultural policy, although as allotment policy went on in the UK um, into the 1800s, that was kind of seen as a separate thing as you know, food became more readily available and allotments became more of a recreational activity and not so much about food access. It almost sounds like... Uh... Yeah, you, so many things come out of um, extension, it feels like. And it almost feels like kind of shades of that where like there's this agricultural policy and like, oh, we need to get more people involved. So, hey, let's go create a little thing. Yeah, I mean, it was just that, you know, there there was not enough food. There was scarcity from the war. And so they said, OK, well, if we give people who don't currently have access to land some area of land that they can farm, then they can grow their own food. So it was really built out of a response to that, this specific policy. And then from there, it became a more popular thing and food access became less of an issue. Um, and so it became more of a, of, a, of a recreational policy. Got it, got it. It also became in the later 1800s in, the, in England, um, much more something for kind of the gentry to do. It became much more popular for the upper class to have like walled vegetable gardens or decorative vegetable gardens or kitchen gardens off of their manor or something like that. Not often something that they would tend to themselves, um, but like Queen Victoria had a very large vegetable garden um, and it just became something that was more seen um, as a status symbol for people with land to, to be able to have garden fresh vegetables. And that also trickled over to the U.S. as well. And that became more of a thing as the U.S. was taking influence from that England Victorian culture. Did any of them have a secret garden? Uh, probably. I think that book was written like in the like early 1900s, so it's probably influenced by this like walled garden movement. Just about every piece of British literature that uh, I've seen or read, you know, there's a gardener involved somewhere, somehow. Right, yeah. And so one thing that I'm not really including in this episode is like the larger idea of a kept estate um, and like a, a landscape garden and, you know, topiary and mazes and things like that that were much more a, bi a bigger influence in that kind of land culture of the of the upper echelons of, you know, the Victorian England. Um, Got it. Yeah, OK. Specifically talking about, you know, vegetable gardens. But like, yeah you know, gardens and keeping them generally was, was a huge thing. So, um, so in these fancy walled gardens and mm -hmm. later in these, I guess, sort of recreational public gardens, what kind of vegetables did these people like to grow? Well, so there were, there was a lot of different things, a lot of stuff that we still grow today. Fruit trees were very popular. Um, there is a technique, uh, of growing fruit trees where you basically, prune them back to a wall. So they're kind of trimmed along a wall. And that was very popular at the time with these walled gardens. But of course, you know, potatoes and onions and a lot of the vegetables that we eat today. But there were also were a lot of vegetables that we don't know about today that were just kind of lost, whether they were regionally native. So they're from that area and now we don't eat them. They're not in the, you know, 
cultural menu, I guess, of fruits and vegetables that are known, um, or if they were just some kind of specific cultivar variety that is no longer grown, and so we don't know about it. So when I was doing research for this episode, there were a couple of examples of like, here's a weird kind of garlic that had its own name and was considered a separate vegetable, but you know, it's, it was grown then and now we don't even know about it. We've never heard of this word before. So we lost a lot of those like really unique vegetables. Oh, I don't like losing food. That makes me sad. I mean, luckily there are some really cool botanical gardens that are doing great preservation work. And if people wanted them, we can probably have a revitalization effort for some of these weirdo garlics out there. <laughs> okay. So... It was in the UK, and it was later also in the US. Mm -hmm. And in 1902, the US had its first school garden, which was in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Um, another kind of different thing in when considering vegetable gardening is like that urban versus rural. So for a lot of rural people throughout history, it's been very common to have a small garden because maybe it's harder to get into town. Um, but between the 1910s and the 1930s here in the U.S., we had the Great Migration, where a lot of rural black folks moved up into urban cities up in the north to escape the Jim Crow South. And they brought gardening with them, and, and urban vegetable gardening became a part of that culture up in the north um, for many African-American communities in these urban cities. Later on in the early 1900s, we had World War I, and food, again, became an issue both here in the U.S. and in England. Um, so we had things like victory gardens, um, which were also called war gardens, which basically um, there was less food. And so the government was creating propaganda to encourage people to garden so that food could be sent overseas to soldiers um, for like soldiers rations. Do you remember watching Veggie Tales? Yes. Do you remember the episode where they were like, vegetables fighting each other that was a lot of the episodes dad that was I don't know. like the premise of no, veggie tales but there was like a they weren't just arguing it was like a whole battle uh i don't remember the whole thing i don't know oh, you say the jericho episode oh that could be that could be yeah you, but you say uh war garden and it makes me think of that <laughs> yes yes that's exactly what i want you to picture no i mean it was pretty much just like a community garden um yeah and so uh, municipalities would put land aside um, for specifically community gardens for people to access so they could grow their own food. Um, in England, allotments, allotment land tripled, which is like a lot. It's huge. Um, then from there, we went into the Great Depression and gardening, again, was a food access issue. And from there, a few decades later, we had the World War II. And again, food access was an issue as you know, food was once again scarce as we had this big war effort. And so Victory Gardens resurged from there. But after that, there, I mean, there was still gardens. There was not any state-sponsored propaganda. And lawn culture in suburbia here in the U.S. became much more in vogue. And so you saw fewer gardens. Um, it was just less common. Not that they disappeared entirely. Um, lots of people had vegetable gardens. But Ever since the 2000s, it's become a little bit more popular, and we've seen a, a dramatic rise in home gardening and home food production as people think more about climate change and the environmental impact of their food and the ways that, the ways that they eat. So what kind of food did they grow here? I imagine it's mostly a lot of the same stuff, like onions, potatoes, uh, garlic, you know, leafy greens. In which time frame? Well, you just went through, like, you know, half of the 20th century, so. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just cover that whole thing. I mean, I guess it's all, you know, good staples that are relatively easy to grow. I mean, it's it's very similar to what we were talking about earlier. Like, we see a lot of the same things. We see a lot of good staples. Um, but we did lose a lot of those specific varieties, what we call, like, heirloom varieties, that were common and they were bred for specific regions or you know micro regions even like you would have these heirloom varieties that would do really really well in just this one part of central texas or just this one part of like northern ohio or something like that okay cool so we, we did see a loss in that um beyond that like yeah pretty much vegetables were popular depending on 
where you were geographically and, and what was culturally relevant to you, that definitely influenced how people grew and just what, what the gardener's preference are. Like that's one of the hugest factors in how people garden. It's just what the gardeners want to eat. And so nowadays, obviously it's not as much of a food access issue, although I imagine for some people maybe it is, but it sounds like it's maybe getting a little bit more popular. Yeah, for sure. And it's much more of like an awareness issue. People are thinking about the nutrition content of their food. And so if you eat fresher food, then it can have higher nutrition. And, you know, thinking about the carbon footprint of your food that you buy at the grocery store versus what you can buy at your house. Um, And I think that's much more the focus of gardening. We see now, according to the National Gardening Survey, that 18 to 34-year-olds account for 29% of all gardening households, which is huge. And that's a higher percentage than we saw in previous generations. So yeah, I think, you know, young people are getting involved, they're getting interested because they are aware. Well, that's awesome. Well, awareness is good. Awareness of, you know, your, your situation, what you need, where you are. And what I'm aware of right now is that it's time for a break. A break! A break. (laughs) Welcome to the break. So, listener, we would love it if you would take this podcast. And while you're discussing podcast with your podcast listening friends or your non-podcast listening friends, tell them about this podcast. Say, hey, friend, I love this podcast, and I think you'll love this too, because we think... If you love this podcast, then they will also love this podcast. Spread it as you would spread seeds in your garden. Maybe you're talking about what a superfood is. Maybe you're talking about how to start a vegetable garden. Maybe you're talking about confusing Star Wars and Star Trek references. (laughs) We really, really love making this show. And we're trying to make it for the people who are also interested in these ideas and these conversations. And we would really appreciate it if you shared it out. We don't pay for any advertising or anything for this show. And so word of mouth is really the only way that we're growing. And we would just love to have more people here who can contribute to the conversation and, you know, who can have fun with us here in this in this little podcast community that we're trying to build. So, I mean, honestly, I hope we never pay for advertising. I mean, who knows? I, I could totally see us getting a billboard. Let's get a billboard along the highway. Oh, Do you well, there love you go. Food? Do you eat food? Check out this podcast. So it's just a picture of me with like two thumbs up, like, hey. <laughs> An extra shout out to our patron listeners, especially to our Starfruit patrons Lindsay, Vikram, Mama Casey, Patrick, and Cheyenne. And to our newest patron, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Andrew. Really Welcome. You coming to join us over on the Patreon. All right. Well, back to the episode. Back to the episode. Dad, do you have a nature fact for us? I do have a nature fact for you. All right. All right. So pollinators can pollinate vegetable gardens, can they not? They indeed can. So common pollinator is the bee. Yeah, correct. An animal that is frequently mentioned in conjunction with bees are birds. Mm-hmm. A word that has bird in it is thunderbird. And the thunderbirds are who flew over my house today. And it was awesome. <laughs> Very good. It was it was cool. Uh, it was a nice little flyover of San Antonio and Austin. Dad, real quick, for, for our non-arrow-minded friends, can you explain what a thunderbird is? Okay, so... The Thunderbirds are a group of pilots in the Air Force that fly fighter jets for show, basically. Uh, They are, you know, some of the best pilots in the Air Force, and it's kind of a nice job after a long career of flying fighter jets, and they do stunts, and they do flyovers, and they were doing a flyover of San Antonio and Austin in honor of uh, healthcare workers during the coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, there's issues with uh, the cost associated with this. I mean, part of the reason the Thunderbirds exist for the Air Force and a similar group, the Blue Angels for the Navy, is for, like, recruiting and promotion and stuff like that. So whatever. And sure, there's a carbon footprint. But, man, when a group of fighter jets fly over your house, it is awesome. Da-da-da-da-da-da, nature fact. 
nature fact. I hope other people got to see them. They were extremely loud. Yep. So you want to start a vegetable garden. Ho hold on there, cowboy. I bet someone wants to start a vegetable garden. <laughs> I, I don't know that. I mean, I sometimes think about starting a vegetable garden. Well, think about it. For this exercise, we're going to talk through what it takes. Okay. Do I even have a spot where I could do a vegetable garden? I don't know. You absolutely do. Really? Well, because mom has grown vegetables at your house. Really? Yes. Not that Definitely. I've eaten. Oh my gosh. Maybe. She okay. Grew lettuce last year. She listens to the podcast. I'm sure I'll hear about this. Yeah, I'm sure you will. All right. So the key factors in figuring out what you can grow in a vegetable garden are one, temperature, the number of cold days, the number of super, super hot days that you get, because you can't really do a ton with that. I mean, you can if you want to build out some infrastructure and have like a little greenhouse or something like that. But that's the key factor. Another key factor is how much sun that area gets. You can't really do a lot if an area does not get a lot of sun. You could like get some kind of utility lamp, but who wants to do that? And also tons of energy. And then the third key factor is your preference. Those are like the three things that are kind of hard to address and change. Are those in that order on purpose? No, not really. I mean, they're all okay. like important. Like I would probably start with preference. I would probably start with what is it that you're interested in growing and then thinking about how the temperature and the light situation in what you have affects what you can grow. Okay. You also do want to consider your soil. It is possible to grow without soil, right? So like if you're in a container or something like that, um, and you're probably going to be amending your soil regardless. So if you're doing an in-ground bed, you will need to be thinking about, you know, what, what my soil is, but you are going to be amending it. So it is a factor, but it's possible to work around it. I mentioned in-ground gardens. That's basically where you put plants directly into the ground. You're still going to be doing things like digging it up and amending the garden and like tilling and stuff like that. But you have now, other types of gardens. Yeah. When you say amend the garden, yes. do you mean like adding compost, adding yeah. nitrogen, or doing what? Those things? Yeah, pretty much adding compost. Adding compost oh, okay. is mostly what I mean. All right. Uh, so yeah, you want to amend your soil if you're doing an in-ground bed because it's very helpful to have compost that's adding microbial life and adding organic matter, which can increase your water holding capacity. Um, you can also do a, a raised bed garden. So this is slightly up above the ground. You can, if you want, dig down into the ground, but one of the big benefits of having a raised bed is that you usually don't have to till down into the dirt very far. Um, so you're, you're like adding six inches an inch, or six inches a foot, two feet, to your garden bed. Um, and so you're not having to like do the work of digging it out, but that also means that you're having to bring more dirt in and you're having to bring in like potting soil or garden dirt or whatever it is that you're using in order to fill up this box. So it can be a little bit more expensive. Okay. And you have to have the box or build the box in the first place, which sounds like even more work. I would say getting the dirt is harder. Building a box, you just go to Home Depot, you get four pieces of wood, and you nail them together. Four? Yeah, one for each side. It's a square. You don't need a piece of wood on the bottom? No, you don't want a piece of wood on the bottom. Oh, so you're just building dirt up higher, basically. Pretty much. Okay, cool. You can also do container gardening, which is not open to the ground, and it's really helpful if you have like a balcony or a deck or something like that, where you want to just put something out but you don't want to like deal with the actual soil and do something larger um, or if you're like in an apartment and you don't have a lot of space it's also helpful if you want to do something that your temperature of your region might not really be as accommodating to so like I've done strawberries before in places where it might have been too hot to do strawberries but I can just pull them in on like the really really hot days and then put them back out later because you're a wizard because so, I get a pot and I can just put it in a pot and then oh, it. Oh, okay. So it's a it's like a potted plant. I thought I was going to ask if it was like hydroponics. No, but no, just no, a potted okay. plant. Just a potted plant. So you still have soil. It's just not the ground. So it's not really what we call soil. It's what we call soilless media. So that would be like potting soil, which is 100% organic matter. So that's like a peat moss or coconut core, which is the outside of the coconut or something like that. It's like an alternative medium that ha doesn't really have any minerals in it. So it's called potting soil, yeah. but it's not 
soil. It's not. It's soil less. Okay. I feel right, like the... <laughs> maybe we talked about this in our soil episode, but this is getting too deep in the weeds for me, so to speak. I, I think we did. But like, yeah, remember we talked about soil and like most of it is just broken down rock. A pot okay. of soil doesn't have any broken down rock. It just has broken down plants. I see. Okay. And it's much lighter because it's like just like this light, fluffy carbon stuff, which is nice. Um, so it's really a lot easier to move. It's cheaper. A lot of benefits to using potting soil. All right. You can also do an indoor garden, which would be something like having container pots, but inside or doing something like uh, I've seen like spice walls before where people like have a little container by their kitchen if they have a window and you can just put all your little herbs and grow little herbs. But you have to have a window with sun. Or buy a lamp from or, Home okay. Depot or Ace Mart or wherever. Okay. If it does the job, sure. So another type is permaculture. So this is a type of in-ground planting where you're planting directly in the ground. But the idea is that you're planting it to be a more permanent landscape. So usually it's not in rows like a typical vegetable garden. Um, and typically you're trying to build it out to be longer lasting. So it typically includes fruit trees or fruit vines. Um, and the beds that you have typically don't get tilled every year. So it's like a, it's like a landscape as opposed to just a vegetable garden. Okay, cool. So it's like part of the, part of the decor almost. Yeah, for sure. Another type of garden, the last one I'm going to talk about, is a hoop house. This one is the most amount of infrastructure of any of the ones on my list. Um, this one we did a lot when I was living in New Mexico because it gets really, really cold in New Mexico. You have a very, very short um, summer season, so it gets cold really quick and then it stays cold for a long time. So having a hoop house, which is basically what we did, is, is we bought really long PVC pipes and then we put like stakes of rebar in the ground and then we would bend the PVC pipe in like a U shape over it. And then we would just like do that like 10 times and then put a tarp over it basically, like a see-through plastic so that the light could get in. But basically it was much warmer inside of this little house that you built. Now, just as an extra weird little piece of trivia for the people that know us, a hoop house has nothing to do with a hoopy house. <laughs> Nor is it where your username on Discord comes from. It is not where not, my username okay. comes from. My internet username is Matt Hoopy, which is a Douglas Adams joke that is extremely obscure. And I thought I was really clever at 15 for thinking of. I mean, for a 15-year-old, it was pretty dang clever, I got to say. Thank you very much. I was impressed. Okay, so you have all of these options. They all require sun and they all require water, I'm well, guessing. they don't all require sun, right? There are famously a lot of people who grow plants indoors with no sun. You can just get a light bulb. You need some kind of UV radiation. And they get busted by the FDA. No, I the mean, DEA. You can do that with tomatoes. <laughs> you can do okay. tomatoes. You can do it with whatever you want. All uh, right. Cannabis is not the only thing that needs that can grow with plants. Plants just use sunlight uh, for the, the energy, for the photon energy to convert CO2 and water into starches. And so they can get that energy from tons of stuff, including just plain old lamps. Okay. You do want to get one that's kind of higher voltage and you can find more information depending on what plant you're growing, um, just so that it's going to be giving off more light. And LEDs are also really popular for this because they don't get as hot, which can also damage a plant. But yeah, you can grow stuff inside without any sun. All right. So there are sun alternatives. But there are no water alternatives. Correct. Okay. So you have different options with irrigation. You have drip irrigation, which basically uses less water per amount of food. So it's like an efficiency question. That's very popular with a lot of people because water bills can get high if you're watering a garden as well as, you know, people living in a house. That makes sense. Got to water the people. <laughs> you can also have some issues with drip irrigation just because you're putting the water right at the base of the plant. So... If you have something like a root vegetable, then sometimes your root vegetables turn out looking kind of weird because they're like contorting themselves to grow directly where that water is, as opposed to something like a sprinkler where the, all of the ground is getting saturated. So the, the tap root can just grow in the natural way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I feel like I've seen some funky looking carrots and maybe this is why. 
Well, there's a lot of reasons to have funky looking carrots. Like maybe okay. there was a rock in the way and so it had to grow around a rock or something like that. No, I had um, no idea. Yeah, I mean, maybe the dirt was super constricted and so it was just growing weird. There's tons of reasons. Um, sprinklers are a good option for, yeah, something like root vegetables if you want. Uh, they can also be a good option if you have like a lovely ground cover. So if you have like a permaculture setup, you d- can just sprinkler it if it's something that's maybe not fully grown in and you're trying to like encourage it. Um, sprinklers are also often used for leafy vegetables because leafy vegetables can be super tender. So stuff like lettuce and arugula. Um, so they're prone to overheating, but they're also like summer vegetables. So spritzing them with a bit of water during the day can help cool them off. Oh, nice. Like a nice little mister on your skin. Exactly. People love it. Plants love it. It's great. Okay. You can also have something called subsurface irrigation, which is pretty cool. I have used this in one form, which is called the olla, which is spelled O-L-L-A. It's a Spanish word. And an olla is basically like a terracotta pot that's um, unglazed, so it's still permeable, right? There's no hole at the bottom, right? It's just a like a complete pot. And so you bury it with just the, t- the top out of the soil, and you fill it with water, and then you cover the top. And because the clay is permeable, the soil matrix has a higher water potential than the pot of water. And so the, the water moves out into the soil matrix. I'm pretty sure I got that correct, but I could be mixing it up. You bury the pot on top of where you plant your seeds? Like right next to it, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, right, little, so little I, watering pot. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's like a little watering pot. Um, it's great. Uh, usually you'll want to water your plants in for the first couple of weeks while they're getting used to the Oya because they don't always know where it is. Um, and so it's kind of like off to the side and they have to kind of grow towards it to like pull the, the liquid out of it to pull the water through the pot. Um, so like if I'm using an Oya, then I usually overhead irrigate for the first like couple of weeks in addition to doing the Oya. Um, occasionally just so they don't get too wilted until they figure out where the oil is. Nice. You can also do rainwater collection, which is great for drip irrigation. Um, I mean, you can use it for oils and sprinklers and stuff too, but it's really easy to use for drip irrigation because you just can use gravity because you're not needing a lot of pressure to get the water out of the little drip emitters. So I think that you just need to put your, your rainwater collection tank something like a foot and a half up above the soil or above where the drip emitters are going to be and then they just like they just emit on their own you don't need any kind of pump or anything like that nice even though you know presumably it just rained yeah yeah i mean like you could just like turn it off and catch the water and then in three days when it hadn't just rained then you could like turn it on and use the tank three days later after a rain you'd need to water again that soon i mean it depends on what you're growing Okay. Maybe, maybe, I mean, you could keep it's water in a tank. You can keep it for however long you want. Fair enough. All right. Well, cool. Is that all about water? That's my water stuff. The steps okay. for actually planting. You can either direct seed or you can transplant. Direct seeding, where you put a seed in a pot or in the dirt or in a raised bed. Um, it's going to be cheaper, but you can have, it can be like less likely that you actually get a plant. Uh, Because when you're transplanting, you see the plant, you know you have the plant. When you're direct seeding, not all the seeds will grow. That makes sense. It can also be hard if you have a shorter season. So like when I was in New Mexico, we would often use transplants because you're like a month ahead, right? It takes like a month less to get the food at the end than if you're direct seeding because you have to wait for it to grow from a seed versus just using a transplant. Yep. Yep. Got to wait a little longer for that extra uh, little germination to take place. Or not germination, but you know the little the little yeah, sprouting, germination. the sprouting germination. part. Oh, the germ- okay. Yeah, germination. You got Great. it. Great, I got it. <laughs> you have to think about your seed spacing um, and like some other stuff, but usually the seed packet has a ton of very helpful information in terms of like how deep to plant the seeds, how far apart to plant the seeds. All of that information should be on your seed packet. You can also opt for a transplant. If you opt for a transplant, it's going to be more expensive, but you know that you have a plant for sure. You also, if you're doing a transplant, once you plant it, you'll want to water it in. So just like watering it so that it's kind of nice. It's like 
Welcome to your new home, little plant. Here is some water for you. You will be happy here. You always want to do that right away. Otherwise, the plant can just get really dried out and have a little bit of shock and it might not make it. Okay. Make it feel at home. You can also grow your own transplants in your own house if you want. Um, you can do this with little egg cartons. You can buy plug trays. You can use whatever. Um, but you can just put a little seed in a little bit of potting soil and you mist it You know, once a day or twice a day. You put it near a sunny window or you get a light so that the little guys grow. Once they're tall enough, then you want to start putting them out for a couple of hours each day increasingly. And that's just so that they get used to things like wind. Because otherwise, if they're inside and then you just plant them in the garden, then it's really easy for their stems to break because they haven't had to build up any extra cellulose to like be sturdy or anything like that. And that process is called hardening off. So you just put them out gradually more each day and they just get stronger and stronger. And then you're ready to plant them. Wow, I had no idea plants were so complicated like that. Yep. And that's all of the notes I took. Do you have any questions? So, all right. When I was a teenager, your grandmother made me dig holes for her tomatoes with a pickaxe mm -hmm. because it was in Dripping Springs and there was limestone a few inches down. And so I had to bust holes through the limestone. Was that actually uh -huh. necessary? I mean, she could have built a raised bed, but if she wanted to go in ground, yeah. Oh, okay. She wasn't just making me do work. No, out towards Dripping Springs, there is a lot of limestone and there's like two inches of topsoil. And then it just goes straight down to what we call parent material, which is rocks. So right. what she was doing was because limestone is a softer rock, she was just carving it out so that she could add in compost and gardening soil and, and these other things as an amendment. So just like super quick, do people need yeah. to worry about pest mitigation? Uh, I mean, everyone likes vegetables, including pests. So okay. you will get them. It will very much depend on where you are in the world and what vegetables you're growing. So it might be something that you have to think about. If you're growing indoor plants, it's going to be less of an issue than if you're growing outdoor plants. But everyone should at least do a, do a cursory Google to see, you know, what are the biggest pest problems for gardeners in my area so you can, you know, kind of be prepared. But it's all a learning experience and it's all about figuring out what pests are in your area, and what they look like. All right. I've got one last question. I've been saving this one for last specifically. I'm pretty sure this was you that I've either heard say or seen post about it on social media, which is something along the lines of growing your own food is a radical act. Mm. Is that Was that you that said it? And if so, could you comment on that a little bit? I have definitely said that. In the past. Okay. Yeah, I think it is a radical act. I think that thinking about how our basic needs are so separated from how we actually operate in terms of like food and water and things like that that are really base um, and how they're kind of built within capitalism and uh, this corporate system that's that's kind of really, really decentralized and includes so many players. And we talked about this some in the COVID episode that we uploaded, but thinking about like how immense that system is and how fragile it can be and how much of a toll it takes on, um, on other people's lives and on the environment and on uh, animal welfare and all of these different factors. I think that, yeah, I think that regaining some of that autonomy and regaining your place in your own survival and considering the way that extracting yourself from that system, even in a small way, can alleviate a burden that's being placed on the environment or on someone's human rights or something like that is for sure a radical act. Wow. I never thought about all that. That is that is pretty heavy. You heard it here first, folks. You want to be radical? Grow your own food. And you can grow a radical, which is a part of a plant. <laughs> no. No. Pretty, pretty good. No. no. Pretty good. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. This show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It is produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at One to Grow On Pod. You can find all of our episodes as well as more information about the show and the team on our website 
onetogrowonpod.com. Join our community and learn more about each episode at patreon.com slash onetogrowonpod. There you can get access to audio extras, fascinating follow-ups, and even custom art created just for you. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Sharing is the best way to help us reach more ears. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.